Okay, so um, our, guest, uh, our guest today uh, is the lead singer and songwriter of an absolutely iconic British rock band. Um, he's a brilliant lyricist, uh, and I encourage you uh, to listen to the songs, like really listen to the songs. Uh, I think he's a great storyteller, and each song has a message in it. Um, he's also a Welshman, another one. Yes, he is. Uh, and a family man. In fact, uh, his family's here today with us. And Stereophonics uh, started about 20 years ago uh, in a garage. Sound familiar? <laughs> but like Google? Um, and, uh, you know, I think they're, what, the, what makes them stand out is they're really true to their roots. They're real musicians um, that have stood the test of time. So just a few uh, facts here. Um, you know, leap, leapfrogged onto the uh, stage with the Brit Award for the Best New Group in 1998. 1998, ring a bell? Uh, um, nine further awards since, six platinum uh, and multi-platinum records. Platinum record is a record that sells more than a million copies. I think that's right, isn't it? Um, quadruple platinum selling best of uh, collection called Decade in the Sun, so four million plus. 11 top 10 singles, including anthems like Dakota, Maybe Tomorrow. Uh, one of four iconic British bands to open the London Olympics in Hyde Park in 2012. Was anyone there? I was. It's was an amazing concert. Uh, a touring group, um, globally selling out stadiums uh, still around the world. I should probably say Stadia. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, there's, uh, Kelly's just about to do a solo tour. Uh, starting in June. I've just got my tickets. They're playing at the uh, Hammersmith, uh, used to be called the Hammersmith Apollo. I think it's the Eventum Apollo now. Uh, so go online, get your tickets. D just do it after the talk. Sold over uh, 10 million albums worldwide, 8 million in the UK alone, making them the, one of the most successful Welsh and British rock, at, rock bands of all time. Uh, and uh, big on YouTube, 220,000 YouTube subscribers and over 150 million views on YouTube. So Google and YouTube are very proud to welcome Mr. Kelly Jones. Hello. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Craig, for those wonderful introductions. Kelly's was far better than mine. We'll talk about that later. Um, to be honest, the only reason we said we do this is because we got a Google tour just before coming here. It's brilliant, it is. isn't it? Goodie bag. It's much better than Hits Radio in Manchester. I just said that out loud. Yeah, got a goodie bag as well. We don't know what it's in it. I think mine's a notebook. I think you might have. Well, he's trying to convert me from Apple. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, it's I've basically got, a bribe, it isn't it? It is a bribe, yeah. That's a um, I think the first thing... The other side, <laughs> which we might do. I think the first thing we should do is just point out that um, despite the fact we do have the same surname, we're not brothers. We're not. I don't think. Well, there's a lot of us that look the same yeah. where we come from. Mm. So you never know. Could be a cousin. <laughs> you never know. Second cousin, maybe? I'll be a cousin, I'll be your brother. Well, but, but, but you look more like me than my brothers look like me, anyway. Yeah. I think I was the mistake there, so there was a 10 year gap between my brothers and my mother said it was a mistake. So. Well, they told you that as well, your parents. Yeah. yeah but... You should actually say we were all mistakes. But, yeah, <laughs> um, actually, weird. It, Jones is a weird thing in Wales. Um, this is a true story. Um, I actually hold a world record for being part of the uh, largest gathering of people with the same surname under the same roof. 1,583 Joneses all got together in the Millennium Centre in Wales in 2000. <laughs> and we beat the Norbergs from Sweden who could only manage 596. <laughs> uh, the show, uh, bizarrely, was called Jones, Jones, Jones. Really? They put a lot of thought into it. I didn't get the invite for Yeah, that. why did you not get invited <clears throat> to I that? don't know. Was Tom Jones there? No, because he's not a Jones. No, but I am. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is awkward. Let's move on quickly, shall we? Um, Craig mentioned there, actually, the, uh, uh, um, actually, weirdly, with the stereophonics and the Google, it's like 25-ish years when it all started, and there's quite a few um, similarities between uh, the two, and as Craig mentioned just before, uh, I suppose the biggest one is that you both started in a garage for I you, did, yeah. what, 1992? Yeah, my, um, to the dismay of my neighbours, yeah. Um, well, Stuart, the drummer, lived in number 62, and I lived in 54. 
and I was practicing Highway to Hell by ACDC in 54, and he was practicing in number 62. So everybody in between was getting a bit pissed off, really. <laughs> so we just decided to maybe come together in the same thing, and we went up my old man's garage. And then my brother Lee came home from the pub, and he was pretty annoyed as well after about two hours, and then we went to the local youth club. So when youth clubs existed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, you were you like sort of 17? Um, when I first started, around about then, I was 12, actually. I was, oh. That was 1987. Oh, wow. Um, and then it went on and on and on. But when we became the lineup that we were on the first record, that was about 1994. So yeah. it was an overnight success, Geth, and it was a very long night. Yeah, well, it yeah, it did take a little while, but when it did, it really kicked off, as we'll mention in a bit. But I suppose that 17, 18-year-old Kelly jamming in different garages in number yeah. 62 and number um, in your house, 54. Yeah. 54. Uh, what was he like? What was a 17-year-old Kelly Jones like? Uh, I was all right. I was pretty quiet, really. Um, I liked playing football. I liked doing boxing. Um, I had two older brothers, so I was following them around, you know. Um, but I was into the music from a very young age because my father was working, going around the working men's clubs. Um, so I would go around carrying his speakers. He was a singer, my dad. He was professional before I was born. He was, had a little deal with Polydor. And he did some shows with Roy Orbison and people like that. And um, when I was uh, growing up, his record was on the jukebox in the local pub, which was weird. Yeah, but it was. Um, so when I used to go around watching him in the clubs, he would give me a fiver for carrying his speakers and a Chinese takeaway on the way home. So, did you have to that pay for really that Chinese takeaway? No. Well? Oh, right. He bought you. But that it was home. a really good incentive to go every weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I learned a lot from watching him in the clubs because, you know, if you play a workingman's club and succeed then you're doing something right, you know, yeah. um, the way you pace the set and all that kind of stuff. So as much as I didn't realise, I probably learned a hell of a lot doing that. And then I ended up doing working men's clubs and pubs and stuff like that in the back of a van and all that for many, many years as well. By the way, um, he changed his name, didn't he, from Jones? He was Johnson because at the time there was Tom Johnson, Jack Johnson. They changed his name to Arwen Davidson. So <laughs> in the phone book, nobody could find us because obviously it was phone books. But... Yeah, I don't know where the Davidson came from. I was going to say, yeah. it's not exactly Tom Jones, is it? No. It's Adwin Davidson. No, and he was Tom Woodward, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. That's why he changed. Yeah. Um, you mentioned boxing and football, but you also had a, quite a keen interest in, in writing as well, didn't you? Because yeah. that's, that's the thing about all your tracks for me. It's, it's I don't know, it's, it, it's a bit of a wordsmith in there. Script um, you love films? Well, I was pushed in the band, really. I mean, I like playing the guitar, but because my old man was a singer, every, every band I joined, they would kind of push me to the front because they wanted, they just assumed because my father could sing, I would be the singer sort of thing. Um, uh, not until about 18 or 19, I felt that comfortable with that. For the first <clears throat> six or seven years, I wasn't that keen on it, but I would do it. And then when I got to about 18, I was working in a fruit and veg stall at about 16 and I was in art school. So I left school at 16, went to art school, did that for five years, filmmaking and animation. And um, during that time of being in art school and working in a market, I would see lots of people in the market and get to know, you know, all different walks of life. And I would be writing a lot of the words down on the back of brown bags while I was serving carrots. I would be writing stuff like Thousand Trees and Local Boy in the Photograph. All I was literally written in a market stall, oh really. Um, but then I would go to film school, and because I was doing sequential art and storyboarding, I would be doing filmmaking sequences, and I'd be writing dialogue. So the dialogue then became um, lyrics, because I'd go to rehearsals on a Thursday and a Sunday, and some of the dialogue I wrote for films I was trying to make would end up coming in songs, like she takes her clothes off and Raymond shop and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of it was very filmic, you know. Um, because they were kind of crossing over in my in my life at that point in time, so it was all very visual and very, yeah, very very, very filmic in themes really. But the music was very anthemic. Yeah, so. it's like a autobiographical as well, yeah. wasn't it? And, and all yeah. the things you experienced, which made up the first album, and literally word did get out then. It did, yeah. Um, it's a bit of a weird question, but did did you, did you want to be famous? Were you no. thinking about it then? No, Stuart the drummer wanted to be famous, and he and he became famous. <laughs> For many, many reasons, and he was lovely, and he was crazy, and he was all of the above, really. But he always joked that he wanted to be famous, he wanted a BMW, he wanted a swimming pool, and, and he got it all. And um, I never really wanted to be famous. I just knew that I had something I was trying to say, and I st still haven't really worked out what that is. But it's a drive that is still within me, um, which I can't really turn off. I know the energy that 
gives me that drive is the same energy that can drive me a bit crazy on downtime. So I kind of always have to have some sort of project going on to kind of focus that in the right way, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but the fame thing and the celebrity thing, it was never really, never really on my agenda, really, and still isn't really. But the thing is, with the success, it comes, doesn't it? Yeah. Whether you like it or not. What, yeah. When was it that you saw, suddenly thought, actually, hang on a minute here, we're, we're going to be quite big, this is this Yeah. Is well, you know, people started putting us on the front of the magazines and we were selling out arenas and stadiums by our second album, which was like 10 albums ago. So it was very, it wasn't fast, but it, it appeared to be fast because obviously we've been working since I was 12. So mm. um, for a long time, I would say for the first 12, 13, maybe 14 years, I never really felt comfortable on stage doing our gigs because I wasn't convinced that the people there really liked us. And for I don't that know long? I think a lot of musicians feel it, possibly, and it took me a while to work out the common sense of it. Well, they must be there. They must like us because they bought a ticket, right? I'm thinking that now, but they're here for yeah. free, so that's the worry. They yeah. can leave at any time, you know? Yeah. So it takes you a while to get comfortable in your own skin doing something that's quite a vulnerable thing, I guess. Um, but once I kind of got used to that, I was into it. But I, I didn't really love the fact. Um, uh, not in a grumpy way, just I didn't, I didn't never felt comfortable walking on red carpets and stuff like that. It wasn't really my scene. My wife loves it, but I'm not very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Brit Ward 98, we mentioned. You yeah. then sort of sell out gigs everywhere. And, you know, probably for any kind of Welsh musician, then you hit the big time, you duet with Tom Jones did, in yeah. Cardiff. You know you've made it. We did. Yeah, I bent his ear one night in a bar. Did Tom, you? Yeah. Was that your idea, was it? Well, he was making a duet album, and yeah. I'd seen all these other people Hello. doing it, and I was a bit like, oh, hello. Um, so I told him I love Sam Cooke and Otis Red and all this stuff, and I think I convinced him over a few pints in um, some pub in Cardiff. Yeah. And then we did the track, and I think that was Tom's, one of Tom's most successful was, albums, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good guy. Good. He was amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I stood opposite him, and there was a glass screen. We sang it twice, looking at each other. And then he said, let's go for a Chinese, is it? <laughs> and I said, all right, nice. So we'll be on to Baker Street and we had a lovely meal. And um, yeah, that was that. And so we stayed mates. And then he took me on under his wing and took me around for weeks and weeks to lots of really nice restaurants that opened the door for him. Yeah. So yeah, he's amazing. You know, he's, still, he's still a machine. Mate? Yeah. Still a friend? Yeah, he is, yeah. I feel like Chinese food's going to be a theme here. <clears throat> I didn't mean it to be a theme, but <laughs> yeah, it was a big part of my youth. <laughs> It's, uh, it's amazing how things changed as well, because uh, obviously I was a fan growing up. It was like a lot of the, the songs were anthems to me and my friends growing up as well. Um, and I remember sort of you doing gig support in bands, I don't know, like um, Feeder and, um, and like Ocean Colour Scene. And then all of a sudden, they're supporting you in gigs. Mm. That must have been a very strange transition for a very humble lad from Cum Amman in, yeah. in the Valley. Yeah, it was. It was weird because... Um you know, we were doing cover versions by Aerosmith and the Black Crows and uh, Lenny Kravitz and all that, you know, one month and the next six months later, we were playing Wembley Stadium with them all, you know, and uh, above them on the bill. And it's, it's very a bizarre uh, thing because you're not ready for that, obviously. Your brain can't cut, quite compute that. So, But we were very lucky. We had a lot of major bands takes on the road. We did, we did David Bowie's last tour across America, the reality tour. We did... Uh, the U2 Elevation tour just after 9-11 in Madison Square Garden and all the firemen come on the stage. Um, we've been really, the Who took us on tour, you know, that was the first major roles we did with them. And, and you're a fan anyway, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, it was, it was amazing. We had a five-side football match with David Bowie, it was pretty bizarre. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Thin White Duke was on the side of the pitch heckling me. <laughs> it was, there's some things you just don't forget, you know. What was it, was he like midfield? He was amazing it? because it was the reality tour, he was actually playing himself. He didn't have an alter ego or anything on it. So he would wander around and he'd come in the dress rooms and he'd watch us sound check. And, and because we were trying to be very quick sound checking, he'd try a bit of this guitar for 40 seconds, try a bit of that one for 40 seconds, do a bit of that. And he'd be watching and then he'd, he'd come over to me and put his arm around me. He goes, you know, if you extended a few of those songs, you might be onto something. <laughs> so he was, he was, uh, he was, really, he was yeah. really lovely to us, yeah. Yeah, he knew a thing or two as well, didn't he? He did know a thing or two. Yeah. He was a Jones. Was he? Yeah, his real did name was Jones. Did not know that? Yeah. 
I think we all are originally, aren't we? we yeah. Change it as we go along. Sorry to bring that back around. But, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's fascinating to me because I know you're saying you're uncomfortable about the fame, but it actually sounds like you're uh, very relaxed in that environment because it is because I'm relaxed with you know what it is. You, I'm relaxed with musicians. I'm right. relaxed with people who do the same thing as me. Um, once I get to know them, but I'm not very comfortable sitting on a, a table in like an award ceremony and all that kind of stuff. Um, probably because we never really win. But uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Nominated a few times. Nominated a few times, yeah, I'm yeah. joking. Um, have you been starstruck? Has is there, is there been an awkward moment where you felt like a very normal person with this big... I've been stem? starstruck by all of them. I'm, you know, at first I'm very silent and I, I don't really like meeting somebody unless they meet us back, you know. Mm. Um, but we've had some, you know, we did the Stones tours and, you know, everybody took us in like around about that time, 2000, and you walk into Keith Richards' address room and he's got a 12-foot snooker table and a, and a shepherd's pie. <laughs> and, and you're not allowed to bust the crust. He has to be the one that takes the first really? portion. And, of course, I bring Stuart in. Then I go, there's a 12-foot snooker table. He goes, oh, I love a bit of snooker. And then he went in straight into the shepherd's pie. No! <laughs> so they sent me back and I had to get another one for Keith, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realise that was a ritual, that was a thing. Oh, it's just, it's the truth, yeah. And then he sat me down and he had a chat with us and he, and he was with his two daughters who are now models, I think, but they were quite young then. And um, he drew the map of Whale, uh, Britain and he put a red line around Wales and he said, that's where the dragons live. Because I think his, I think his mother was Welsh. Was, yeah, so... They, probably, probably a Jones at She some was point. Jones as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, by the way, if you see a dragon in the blueberry room later on, if you're having a, a meeting, that will be Kelly's um, daughters who have done that. Oh, yeah. Just been they draw dragons, really. It's a Welsh thing. It's a graffiti. It's, it's actually very good. It wasn't bad, was it? Real talent. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now you're at Superstardom. You are running the show. Just quick, did you have a rider? Do you have a rider? Pie? Yeah, do you have a rider? We like... didn't have Shepherd's Pie, no. No. What, what was your rider? It's the same as we got now. It was just... Chinese? No Chinese, no. <laughs> uh... The usual, really, white wine, red wine, beer, yeah. spirits, water. I love that. It's old school. Yeah, it's it? never really changed. Bit of whiskey, because they say you have the whiskey voice. I've never liked whiskey. I've seen, I've yeah. read that. The irony. No, whiskey, gravel voice, like gargle sandpaper and stuff. But um, no, I've never drank whiskey. <clears throat> no. Good, good question, Geth. <laughs> I like um, vodka, but this is water. <laughs> That's what you think, um, Kelly. How do you, you know? I was chatting to Craig before, and I mean, what's happened with Google's incredible. They stay at the top of their game. They're market leaders. How do you do that? How do you stay at the top? And you've been doing it for so long. I think, for me, I like to um, learn stuff all the time. So I think <clears throat> when we got signed, I always thought that was the first step on the ladder. And then I, and then I thought that you know it was just after the Britpop kind of explosion, really. So it was Oasis and. And blue and all that, but a lot of the bands are around there, they all kind of fell apart. Um, and by watching that, you could see if you haven't really got the craft of the songwriting together, then when the scene goes away, you kind of go away with it. And I didn't want to be part of a, a scene, I didn't want to be part of the Welsh scene when they started making that thing because you know, I didn't want to be attached to anything. Um, to me, it was about always wanting to leave behind a catalogue of music that stood the test of time. Mm. That's all I ever want to achieve, and um. So that's all I've ever wanted to do. That's all I've ever focused on is, is the catalogue. Um, and every time I make a new record, I try to play guitar in a different way, sing in a different way, learn to play the piano, bring different musicians in, whatever it might be. Each time you do it, if you're not challenging the sound of what you're trying to make, and I guess looking up to people, whether it's Prince or Bowie or Madonna or whoever it was at that time, you're always trying to make something that you, you can't quite do yet. And then you've got to learn how to do it, you know. Um, and I think by doing that, you, you kind of stumble across accidents. Sometimes it works, sometimes it really doesn't work. Um, but then sometimes when you hit, you know, like when we brought out Say La Vie a few years ago, people thought, we were 14, 15, thought that was our first song, and there was lots of 15-year-old kids in the front row, and because the energy of that song talked to them, and then they look at them and they go, oh, there's actually another nine albums I better go and look at. Mm. Um, so it's constantly trying to do that thing. There's people who followed us since 96, and there's some people who only discovered us last year. So, mm. And that's kind of, you know, that revolving door is, is the most important part for us, because if, you, if you're only going to cater to people who, who just want you to keep making word gets around, then you're not going to really get very far. You're going to have a bunch of people in the shows as old as me, and, mm. and I don't really want to play to them all the time. You yeah. know, I want to play to everybody. Um, it's about 
trying to keep it growing and developing and and the internet has really helped in some ways because we wouldn't have played in places like Mexico City and Kuala Lumpur and all these different places all over the world because these kids are just finding out music through streaming and stuff like that. So, you know, Mexico City was people crying in the front row, like 15-year-old kids who never... It's quite bizarre. Yeah. It's, right, it's really yeah. weird, you know. Yeah. Weirdly, actually, um, I did this earlier because I thought I'd make the, the use of being in Google. And um, I had a look to see where you were most searched around the world. Oh, Do you right. have any ideas where no. that is? I mean, that's a tough question, isn't it? Cardiff? Well, let's have a look. Probably at not Cardiff. Let's go around the world first. Let me get up on the screen now. This is, uh, this is where it's at, as you expect, the United Kingdom. I mean, when was your last gig in St. Helena? <laughs> not quite sure even where that is. Where is that? <laughs> uh, you've got the uh, UAE there and then uh, Australia as well. That comes up. We've just come back from there. Yeah, we did, yeah. We did the opera. like you there. And then cities-wise, as you can imagine, we'll never let you down. We'll always be for you there, Kelly. There we are, unbelievable. Pair up in threes in Cardiff. <laughs> that's pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> 32 in Liverpool. I mm. wonder what that's all about. I I'm hoping that's a million, though, um, Cal. They just didn't have the room for it, so... Yeah. yeah it's good. Yeah, Melbourne. <laughs> but on, and on a serious note, though, and I might be a little bit biased saying this, but you talk about constantly trying to renew things. Like, um, A Thousand Trees, 97. Mm. Dakota, 2005. One of my favourite tracks of all time, Indian Summer. 2013 that's that's you know 15 odd years it still sounds brilliant to me has there been a record um where you thought this is brilliant this is definitely going to do well that hasn't or vice versa does that happen or do you even um the only the only song i've ever written which lasted which which was written in about 10 minutes and took about three hours to record was dakota and the the minute that i wrote that in a in a hotel room that's the only time I've ever texted a record company guy and gone, I think I've got. Really? Yeah, that's okay. the only one. Apart from that, I don't really pick the singles. I mean, I, I write them, record them, and then everybody gets together and they say they like this, they like that. And um, I've never tried to write the single like a factory kind of writer, you know? Um, yeah. So, no, it's, um, it's, quite, it's quite funny how they come about, really. Um, there are challenges as well in any business as they're in as a band. You know, like, you're four now, but... You know, you've been a different four a couple of times over the years, if that makes yeah. sense. That must be really, really difficult. But is there a drive in you that thought, I've got to make these changes if we're going to sustain our success? Well, I think that, like, going back to the, the drive is the force of what keeps every band going. If, you, if, you, if it's really what you are, I don't think I kind of choose it, really. I don't sit down and try to write songs. I think the songs kind of channel through you. They kind of come out that way. Um, but I've got that drive where... I'll go to the studio and I'll stay there till two in the morning. I'll get up and I'll do the family stuff in the morning and then I'll go back there um, by 10 o'clock before the engineers turn up. It's just, when I'm in that mode, I'm, I, I love it. That's when I feel the most free and I feel most in the flow of what I'm doing. And it's solving problems and it's challenging and all that sort of stuff and it's frustrating and it's everything above all that. But, but the rewards, when you actually make those songs, um, they, they're, they're only yours for a certain amount of time and for that little block of time you can kind of see them and manipulate them a little bit and then once you kind of hand them over then fortunately and unfortunately they kind of become marketing tools for people to sell records and then they become the songs again when you play live you know yeah um so it, it kind of goes a bit strange and then you look back at over 20 years and there's a lot of them and thankfully we've been a band that has got a lot of kind of big songs on every album so it's not just dependent on like a one hit here or one hit there so yeah yeah. You, you touched on a few things in the answer before that, actually, and one of them was sort of the internet, and now you're huge in Mexico, and St. Helena, yeah. which you uh, learned today. Um, and there's a couple media. of people in Melbourne, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, social media is such a big part of everything now, isn't it? Especially in terms of promoting your, your brand and, and the music. Uh, you, Seraphonics have accounts, but not Kelly. No. Why not? Uh, I've never felt the need really. I guess some people need validation and, and, and they like telling people what they do in their everyday life. I, I suppose my outlet is in my music. Um, I, I've never really wanted to, you know, have a Twitter account or an Instagram account or anything like that. I prefer, maybe it's an old fashioned thing, but I prefer if you were, if I am an artist, if that's what people want to call what I do is, then I prefer the art to kind of speak for what it is that I do. If people know too much about my 
personal life or my real life, then the words that I'm writing, they're going to be very hard for people to interpret in their own way, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's always supposed to be open for interpretation. Does it dilute it as well? In a, I think it dilutes it a bit, and I think... <clears throat> um, I think there's an element of mystery when I was growing up that I didn't know about any of the artists that I love, and I couldn't find out about anything yeah. about those artists. You know, I was an ACDC fan, I was an Otis Redding fan. You know, I couldn't find anything. I mean, now you can find an ACDC T-shirt in Henny's, which is annoying, because I couldn't find <laughs> one anyway. Uh, I, you know, I wrote a letter to the fan club. It took three years for a reply. <laughs> You so, shouldn't have sent the pigeon, you should have just sent an email. So I come from a different time in that sense, and I quite like, I suppose it's an old school thing, you know, a, a, an artist is meant to be seen and not touched and all that, but I, I don't really take it to that serious extent. <laughs> but I've never really felt the need, and I haven't, seriously, I haven't got the, the time to be telling people my every move, really. Um, everybody in the office will say, can you send us a picture when you're making a record, and I'll send one. Where it goes, I don't really know. Yeah. Um, and I don't really want to be reading comments about what I do either, because I think that can distract as well, because not everybody's going to like what I do, and not everybody's going to care what I do, but if I start reading what everybody's doing, then it's only going to get in the way of what I do next. So, yeah. I mean, I, I do it for me, really. Yeah. Ultimately, every song I've ever written, I've had to write because I was going through whatever I was going through to get it out. And then you can have it, but the, the main reason I've done it is because I need to do it. Yeah. And, so it's not really for anybody else at that point. Yeah. You know? It's interesting. And actually trying to just Googling Kelly, you can't really find out that much about you. You know, I think there's a small paragraph about family and personal life. It's quite funny. I, you know, I, I pride myself on diligence and research doing my work. <laughs> but coming to Google to do a gig for Google is a bit weird. Because you go to Google and then you go, what do I do now? Like, you know, <laughs> Googling Google. Um, but yeah, there's not much about you in there, about your, your yeah. family life. And it's just, just <clears> watching <throat> you now with the, with the girls, it's obvious that you're a dad first and yeah. great girls and your mates with them as well. Yeah. How, how, have you, how have you balanced that? That's, I mean, you're touring, you're writing albums, you're, you're gigging. How do you, how do you balance that life? Well, we know we got... I've never really been a dad that wanted uh, nannies and help and stuff like that. Everything we have around us is all family. Um, and it's important now the girls are older. I, I'll only go away for two, three weeks at a max and then come back and then I'll go away again and come back. So it's not... You know, before we would go away, do an American tour for six weeks, go straight to Australia for another eight weeks, and, and, and you know, you'd be gone forever, really. Um, but it's an important balance to keep, you know, the, the, the hours I put in of, of being a father and doing, getting up and doing the school runs and doing all the stuff, the relationships you build, it, it, uh, hopefully, and it seems to be paying dividends for the relationships you have in the years where they, they can want to communicate more with you, you know. Um, and I've always thought that was important. I had a good relationship with my parents, my brothers, and all the rest of it. So I don't really want to put anything before that. So that that is always, if I get a schedule, you know, it, it's become to the point. You know, the half terms are in pink, and I have to kind of work tours around <laughs> some of that stuff. Yeah. So, because you want, you know, you want to be around, and then luckily they come today. They've had a free goodie bag, so they'd probably be uh, <laughs> all right now today. I was going to say, actually, do, do they think you're cool? Or no. is today probably the best thing you've ever done? For they them? thought I was cool up until about four <laughs> years ago, and since they started secondary school, it's kind of like on the low down. Yeah, is it? Yeah, they don't... We don't talk... Well, no, even the school. The school asked me to go in to do a battle of the bands and all stuff like that, judging, and I said no, because I want the kids to walk in their own footsteps. I don't yeah. want them to walk in what I've done. I don't... You know, I want them to be their own people and all that sort of stuff. So um, they don't talk about me in school. If somebody Googles me and finds out about it, Googles me, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> well then, done, Kelly. I, I didn't. I wasn't. A, you know, but, um, it, yeah. No. Now they try to keep it private, and so do we. So you know, it was weird. They probably are finding out what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis from social media more than they are you telling them, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really know. I didn't know you're doing a gig in Mexico next week, Dad. Well, the thing, about, the thing that winds me up the most about all this stuff is that me and my wife have many conversations about this. I have people come up to me telling me what my family are doing, and yeah. I don't know about it. <laughs> yeah, it's creepy, isn't it? Like, yeah, like the hairdresser will say to me, you know, you say, no, I saw Jackie doing so. I'm like, how? When? I, don't, I haven't even found out about it yet. But they who, know. Um, who is your hairdresser? Because you have got great hair. <laughs> Genuine. I've always thought that about you. Well, it's not it? down to him. Oh. <laughs> it's cuts, Welsh, it's Welsh. Just cuts, it? No, Welsh. Johnny. You won't, I'm not giving him a plug, no chance. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, listen, I've babbled on enough. If you've got a question uh, for Kelly, please, please, please feel free uh, to ask away. That's that's why we're here. Um, weirdly, they have put like this sort of um, sort of a comedy mic in the middle. I mean, that, that's the most sort of an, an attractive way. Like, who's going to go up there to start a question? I, I wouldn't. It's a lot of pressure. I wouldn't do that anyway. So we have got a roving mic as well, so you can pay it a hand up, and I'll come to you. Uh, so have a think if you've got anything to ask um, Kelly. But before we do that, one last thing I'd like to touch on is um, the fact you're. You're also going to be doing a solo tour. Um, I am, yeah. Which like, might surprise a lot of people. And I know you like to do them every now and then, like, what, yeah. every decade? Yeah. <laughs> was it 2007 you did your last one? Uh, yeah, the band is a bit like having a good marriage, really. Um, you know, they, I, yeah, they tried to give me some space. And I'll say, look, it's not you, it's me. I need to go off and do my own thing for a bit. And it, it, it's just, you come to the end of a world tour, and part of you thinks that you want to quit for a bit, because you'd be bored, or you'd a bit fed up of hotel rooms and buses and stuff like that. So, you, but in reality, I think is you want to try something new. So, doing a solo tour, you get a chance to talk about how the songs are written, why you've written those songs, uh, do versions of the songs that people have never heard before, do new songs that you've never played and may make a record, may not make a record, and um, it's a chance to be a bit more. Um, I guess personal with the people that have come to watch you because when you're playing a big show in the stadium with the big lights and the screens and all the rest of it then it becomes very much based on anthems and big songs because that's what people are there for, they're there for a good night out but um, when you're doing a solo show you know we got a guy playing a trumpet, we got a girl playing a violin and it'll be kind of very raucous moments but then very kind of beautiful moments. It was a very different kind of dynamic to a, a stereophonic show you know so and as a musician it's nice to try to do that sort of stuff, because then you would learn things from that, and then you can take it on to do other things, yeah. Uh, and the boys are fine with that? They fully support that? They, they don't know, yeah. <laughs> no, they do, no, they do know, yeah. No, Richard, well, Richard, I've been in school with Richard since he was three. Richard Jones, that Richard, is. He's Jones, <laughs> and they thought we were brothers, and he had his name tattooed on his neck. I, actually, speaking of Jones, when Richard turned up to school one day, after going for a tattoo when he was 15, he shouldn't have been, obviously, and he had Jones C written on his arm, but it was spelt wrong. No, oh, no. So I was the person that told him that that actually says John Z. They put the E in the, in the wrong way, wrong way, uh, place. And, uh, and and they think he had to go back and have it tattoo, tattooed over with a, uh, a a larger skull. Right. So what is it now, like John Air Skull it was, Y? It was John's E Y instead of writing Jones with yeah. a Y. Yeah, it was wrong anyway. He's got a big I'd, bicep, maybe, just have yeah, extra he's, space for He's it. got a big arm. Yeah. He has got a big yes, arm. Yes, yeah. But this was art by Roy in the Ronda Valley, so... Oh. <clears throat> yeah. I, hope, I, hope, I hope he's not still there, actually. <laughs> if I he like is... I you're giving him a plug, but not If he is, there. it's always spell check on Google, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. So what was we saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, he did give me permission, yeah, so, he did, yeah. Solo tour, which starts in Scotland, actually, doesn't it? And it yeah. started June. Uh, I, I like the fact Kelly's given himself a day off for his birthday. Yeah, <laughs> and, and do you mind if I say you're, like, you're 45? 45. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, you just... I, I suppose you've answered this question already, but you, you're not giving up, you're not, you don't want to stop, do you? This, this is no. a constant journey for you. I don't know what else to do. When I stop, I go a bit mad, really. So, yeah. You play football, could have been a boxer. <laughs> Yeah. Quite handy? Yeah, I stopped, I stopped after a point. Um, no. I, I, like doing, I like doing what I do. I, I like doing the... You know, I, I was a part... I, was, I started doing some directing of the videos and, and screenplay writing. I did that for a bit with BAFTA, and I love doing that. But it, at the end of the day, it all comes back to storytelling, really. Yeah. And, and I do it best, I think, through music. Yeah, it's definitely been the yeah. theme, for sure. Do you mind if we take a few questions no. from the floor? No, I don't mind. Uh, yeah. Hey, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, and Hi. firstly, thank you for the music. It's uh, thank you. been a big fan. Um, I've got one question around, around the storytelling um, that you've mentioned already. Um, two songs that are a particular favourite of mine, a bit abstract ones, perhaps. Um, Rainbows and Pots of Gold, which is a song about, presumably yeah. about a breakup. Yeah. Um, and Vegas Two Times, which is a, quite a rocky song, which is... Yeah. Two, two very, very different songs. Um, it's a bit of a kind of a strange question to ask because I just want to know a bit more about what those songs are about. They're a bit selfish, um, question, I suppose. 
Rainbows and Pots of Gold was about <clears throat> quite dark, actually. It's lowered the tone. Um, it's definitely lowered the it's tone. It's not lowered the tone. Can but, we find, uh, not find a more positive first question? It no. was, uh, let's say, I was, I was with uh, like a childhood sweetheart for many, many years. You're not, not going to like the answer. And um, It was an expensive we, find. We, we, we broke up and then um, I discovered that she was then with my best friend. <laughs> So the song was about me then offering an olive branch to him um, so we could kind of still be friends sort of thing because um, we had a major, major fight and the, <laughs> and the police came and took us away. <laughs> <laughs> that's the very, very diluted version of it, but that's kind of... Quite I'm sure my kids are going to quiz me on that one in the car. No. Um, <laughs> Vegas two times was... Um, I went to Vegas and Twice. I, um, <laughs> well, that's the thing. <laughs> I went to make a video with Tom Jones in LA, but we went via Vegas because he was playing his last night of a 15 night stand in Vegas. So when we went to see Tom, this was in 1998, maybe. So we stayed up all night with Tom Jones having a drink. And, uh, and then we watched his show the next night. And uh, because we'd kept him up all night, when he came on stage, he had about 15 glasses of water and he put a spotlight on us in the booth and he said, if you're wondering why all these waters are here, he says, because those bastards kept me up all night. <laughs> and then we had to leave Vegas the next day to go back to LA to make the video. But we got lost. And as we were leaving, we went round in some weird circle and we ended up back in Vegas. <laughs> and we literally had to leave two times and that's what it was. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, so thank Hi. you for coming. It's really cool to meet you. Okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, given kind of your job, right? You, it's obviously a very high pressure job, and there's mm. a lot of the energy must be, you know, really crazy. Probably really takes a lot out of you. So I'm wondering, how do you actually balance your life? You talked a little bit about it between your family life and personal, but what do you do personally to kind of take the edge off when things get when they escalate? Yeah. When you're on tour for whatever eight weeks on nonstop, etc. Not enough, really. I'm pretty crap at giving myself any time, I have to say. Um, I kind of get into um, a bit of a treadmill of when I start, I, I'll, 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 I'll do the work and I'll do the shows and then I kind of get engrossed in it. And when I'm with the family, I'm, I'm very much engrossed in that. And the only thing I kind of do outside of that, really, is I'll, I'll go for a run or something like that or, or, or um, you know, watch films or stuff like that. But a lot of the time, I've never really been very good at giving myself back as much as I need, so I guess I find most of the release. I feel most calm when I'm, when I'm writing or I'm recording or playing. But the time, unfortunately, when you're on the road, you have two and a half hours on stage, and the rest of the time is in hotel rooms, which I can't stand, really. That's the bit that, you know, jet-lagged in, in the middle of a hotel in Australia, then the other side of the world, when your family's on the other side and you're all on the wrong clock. I don't enjoy that part, so. I don't know, I'm still learning on that side of it. It's not quite been worked out. It's a ran random fact is that you actually support Leeds United, don't you? Is, is I do, I think they're going to mess it up as well. Yeah, yeah. they won last night, big Preston. But it, like, yeah, when was the no. last time you saw Leeds United play, Kelly? Uh, when they were playing Real Madrid in the quarterfinal of the European Cup, which was about <laughs> a few years back. 15 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So you need to watch Leeds more, that will help. That's my well, yeah, you're right. Actually, I'm I crap. People ask me, do you want to go to football or golf or do anything? But I'm, I'll say yeah, and then I, I never do. I like a pint of Guinness. If yeah, I do like having a pint of Guinness. There yeah. you go. Sorry, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> I really like having a pint of Guinness. Yeah, that calms me down. <laughs> yeah. Guinness helps everything. Guinness is good for you. It's true. It's true. Uh, thank you both for the uh, fascinating talk. And sorry, this is also a little self-indulgent question. So shut me up if you. No. Around 20... All right, enough. Pass the mic off. <laughs> <laughs> Around 20 years ago, 21 years ago, um, me and my mates were also in a band. Um, we came to watch you in, I think it was Avon Lido. Oh, yeah. Or Avon or something. Yeah. Um, and afterwards, we were having a few, let's say, drinks with Stuart. Yeah. Um, and I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying drinks because my boss is probably here. Um, yeah, so we were on a chat with him afterwards, and um, we asked him about how, how you guys got your big break and what we could do. And he said you used to jump on stage while bands went off. Like Skunk and Nancy would play, they'd go off for a break, you'd jump on mm. to play their instruments and try and get your name out there that way. Yeah. Was that true, or was he having us on the whole time? 
No, I mean, we, we, you know, when we were playing in clubs and stuff, we'd always <clears throat> um, go and play on other people's equipment and stuff like that, yeah. And Skunk and Nancy took us on tour for a little bit. Um, there was a month in 1996 where we were opening up for Kanicki, which, which was Lauren Laverne's band. Um, she was really funny, actually. As soon as you saw her on stage, she was brilliant to talk in. class, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we had the Mannix shows, we had the Skunk and Nancy shows, we had the Who, um, Three Colours Red and all that. And that was all within three weeks. And, and then you go around the, the country and you steal their fans and then you go and do your own shows and then there's loads of people there. So, yeah, he wasn't completely lying, but you never let the truth get in the way of a good anecdote. <laughs> Uh, what happened to the band out of interest? We were quite successful. Quite, <laughs> quite successful. Still in the garage back in. <laughs> uh, any more for Kelly? Ah, uh, yeah. Hello. Hello. Thanks both for coming in. It's such a treat to have you um, have you come in during the week. Um, I had a question. Obviously, the music industry has like evolved um, since you've been doing what you're doing. Um, what kind of questions or advice do you give to um, artists who are kind of starting their careers now and what are the different challenges that you think they faced to when you were breaking through? Um, I don't think I'd want to start now. I think, um, I think it's much harder for young musicians to develop I, because I think there's so many stats involved. I think record companies and management companies and all you know not, not to put them in a, in a bad light but there's a lot of statistics people follow now more than like when we were starting out for example what, what they did with us was they wouldn't let us play in London they made us avoid London so we'd have to play in Newcastle and Scotland and Wales and build up a proper fan base um, and do 15 interviews a day in every university uh, so by the time the the media caught up with us we were actually we had a real fan base, so if, if the media kind of turned on us or the record wasn't successful, then we already had a grounding. Um, so the only thing my advice would be really, I think it still stems back to the fact the songs have to work because now it's a bit like the 50s, the song is more important than the album really because people are just downloading or streaming one song and if that song's not very good, then people are not really gonna listen to you at all. So I think it'll always come back to the songwriting craft really. Um, you've been quite um, open as well about you know the, the TV shows now in yeah. terms of the manufactured bands with X Factor, uh, The Voice, etc. Uh, that's not really something you've ever advocated, is it? It's, it's not something you, I don't think you're it's a something. Fan of. Well, I don't think it's something you can judge really. I mean, <clears throat> I have been asked to judge on all those shows, mm. um, and I'm not against the shows. I think they're great Saturday night telly, and I sat down with the kids when they were a bit younger, and you watch and you have a laugh and all that, but. I think it's very hard once you even, even if you win, to go on from that point. You're always going to be a contestant winner in something. I know some people have been massively successful, but I think the majority of those people, it's um, it's a different way to come into the in, into the game. Then really, you know, I think you have to play in a club where there's only three people that know you. You have to know what it feels like to die on stage. You know, you have to feel like I don't want to walk out of the dressing room because I'm embarrassed how crap I was tonight. Mm. And unless you have those feelings then you're not gonna, you can't learn that walking into a football stadium, mm. you know. You have to learn that from the ground up and that's no different, I think, from any trade. You, you have to make your mistakes yourself, you have to walk into your own walls, otherwise you're not really gonna, not gonna one, you're not gonna appreciate it when you get it and it's a bit like a lottery winner. You give a lottery winner 10 million quid, you're guaranteed 99% of them mess it up. Yeah. But if you earn the money, then somehow you know what to do with it, you know? It is massive exposure, isn't it? We, we were yeah. chatting to uh, the 18-year-old on Britain's Got Talent on Saturday, and all of a sudden, bang, you know, yeah. she wasn't even expecting it. Do, do you think you would have coped with that at no. 18? I couldn't do it. I couldn't do live telly every Saturday. I'd fall apart. No yeah. chance. Mate, I can't do it now. <clears throat> no, I couldn't. Honestly, genuinely couldn't. I've never enjoyed one live TV show in my entire life. No. I mean, I mean I, I, when it's finished, I like it. Yeah. Like watching it back. Yeah. With the boys of the pint, but leading up to it, no, I'm not. It's, it's, it's like red light fever, and so you're not going to do Strictly Come Dancing anytime. I've soon. been asked. Have you? Did you watch the Welsh guy in uh, 2007? Came third. Is that you? <laughs> Enjoy that. I've played on there though. I've sang on there. I think you have, yeah. I've sang on there. Did you vote for me? I didn't vote, no, because no. like I just said, I don't really do the voting thing. Yeah, fair I didn't like a judge, Geth. <laughs> Got to look after the Welsh, though, haven't you? Yeah, no, I didn't, mate. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't watch that one. <laughs> uh, any more questions or we can... Oh, yeah, okay. Got, yeah, sure. 
I should have said, uh, introduce yourself as, as well. That would have been nice, but it's probably a bit too late for that. So. Yes, uh, thank you guys for coming, first of all, very inspirational um, meeting. Um, uh, Kelly, you mentioned that uh, with all the new music, you uh, try to experiment, bring new things, bring new instruments, and so on. I think that's a common trait that we Googlers have uh, with you, then we like experimenting. Sometimes you quickly fail, but yeah. sometimes you really do well. So my question is, uh, what inspires you in, in particular outside of music that you do that you know help boost your creativity? Um, <clears throat> I guess I've always took my inspiration from for good or for bad, you know, um, from whatever I'm going through in my own life. Really, on my kind of, if you want to call it a journey through life, you know, when I started doing it, I was like 12 years old when I started writing songs, I was probably about 18. And the 18 year old version of me compared to the 44 version of me is very different, I hope. Um, and there's lots of mistakes I've made and lots of things I've done which are good and bad and all the rest of it. And, um, and you have to deal with that in different ways. So I think it's, for me personally, it's like a manifestation of, of, of stuff that's inside me that I have to, has to come out. And, um, but when it comes to sonics and music and all that sort of stuff, I take inspiration from everything I listen to. Lots of stuff from films, actually, um, sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, when I was younger, a lot of it was conversations. A lot of people talking, and I would take things from conversations, like literally live-action conversations, and kind of turn them into songs and stuff like that. And then people would come up to me in the workman's club when I go home and start telling me their life story, hoping I would put it into a song, <laughs> but start the conversation with, don't put this into a song, but... <laughs> And then they would tell me that. So that happens a lot. <laughs> happens a lot. You know, it's, not uh, it's, it's true, though, isn't it? You, you're not allowed to fail anymore, especially yeah. the media. And I suppose Google are really good for it because you're able to, you're established. And yeah. so are you. You're allowed to fail. And if you, if you don't fail, how do you learn? Yeah, well, you are, I think, well, I think, no, I think you have to, I mean, you, going back to when, like when we did do that David Bowie tour, we watched him do a different show every night. When he was in middle America, he was doing a very different show to what he was doing when he was on the East Coast and like New York and stuff, you know. And I learned a lot from that because he's catering to different people mm -hmm. in different walks of life. And you can be indulgent and selfish, but at the same time, you can be very smart how you do that, you know. Um, and you do have to make mistakes. Not every record you make is going to be successful. And, and, you know, if you don't do the mistake, then you've got nothing to come back from each time either. So it's trial and error, really. I mean, you don't know, do you, you know. And it's in so many different people's hands when you hand it over. Some songs you feel very personal, or you think people will connect to, they don't, and other times you just throw it away and people love it. Yeah. It's a very odd thing, really. Yeah. I think that's probably... Oh, should we do one more? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, Craig that's will probably okay. kick me off when we have to <laughs> leave. Hello. Hi, yeah. um, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Okay. Um, and I love how we've spoken a lot about you being a family man and about having, a, having drive. And I just wanted to know, like, being so successful, how are you able to impart this on your children? Because, you know, obviously they've grown up with seeing you succeed, but they may not necessarily have seen the backstory. Yeah. How do mm. you kind of still impart the drive? Uh, well, you know, I, I think anybody that knows me and knows me and knows my kids knows that's not really based around any kind of celebrity status or anything like that. We don't, we don't kind of live like that. Um, it's very kind of grounded upbringing. They were like totally fine with me, weren't they? It was yeah. really surprising. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, grounding wise, I guess, I think all of this conversation, like anything else really, I think the most thing I've learned in all of life really is you have to be honest with yourself. And if you put the most honest version of yourself out there, then it becomes its own success because you're being real about stuff. And I think with the kids, I've always been straight with them. I've always told them what they want to know. And I've always told them, you know, what's going on, really. And I think even today, you know, I told them to to walk, to come to see me, to get the taxi, to come to you. And then they split up and one caught the bus. And the whole point of the walk was to get a bit of fresh air because it was a sunny day. So. We had a bit of a moment about that. <laughs> but it was there, but then it turns into a funny moment because we have a line. We know when, you know, they'll apologize and I'll apologize if I'm in it wrong and then we'll have a crack about it, you know. But um, I think the difference between my generation growing up and theirs is that when your parents would give you a bollocking when you were a kid and then they'd walk off, you didn't quite know why. Mm -hmm. But now I'll give them a bollocking, but then I'll explain to them why and then we'll have a chat about that. So. 
and look, it, it's not perfect by any way or means. You know, I, I'm, I've never brought up a 14-year-old girl before or a 12-year-old girl or a 3-year-old girl. I'm learning how to do it. So each time it happens, I'll kick myself to death when I go to bed because I've, I've messed it up or I haven't done it right or whatever. And then, you know, my wife will say, you know, you're being ridiculous and all the rest of it. But that's the way I am. I'll overthink pretty much everything. And then write it down and make And then write it down and make a song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> write it down, make some money, and then they take it all. <laughs> it's a funny it's circle, like really. A circle, which is probably the, the yeah. perfect way to finish things off, I think. <laughs> um, I think so. Listen, Kelly, thank, thank you. you so much for your Cheers, time Gert. today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gents, Kelly Jones. <laughs>